Hello, happy Sunday and happy new year. 2021 is with us and uh, everyone join us in Greenhouse South Florida, Greenhouse Tampa, Orlando, here in Gainesville, all over the world possibly. So uh, really glad to be opening up the scriptures with you this morning. I have a few of my friends here with us this morning. They're going to help like uh, me preach and amen. I know you're going to be amening in your chair or with your bed, with your family, wherever you're at but they're also going to be helping us amen a little bit here, right? You guys good? So I gave them hankies so they can like wave them if I say anything. Um, I, you know, we've all been deeply excited to move into 2021. It's like, finally, it's like, I remember the song, I think it's by uh, Prince where it says, party like it's 1999, moving into 2000. I feel like that, that should, have, it should have been party like it's 2020, December 31st, we're moving into 2021. Everyone's looking forward to a new year. And when I'm looking back on 2020, it's a year of deconstruction. I think it's a year of deconstruction of personal mental health, a deconstruction of uh, maybe physical health, a deconstruction of relationships, a deconstruction of people's faith, a deconstruction of like how people think about church and gatherings and making disciples. It has been, 2020 was a year of deconstruction. So when I was praying for this time I'd have with you guys for just a few moments, I was thinking about this word rebuild and this being a year where God and the, I think God has used this to deconstruct and it, how we reconstruct on the foundation of Jesus Christ is really up to us. So I prayed about it and felt prompted to preach out the book of Nehemiah. Um, I love the series we did in 2020 on Esther, and this is a similar theme. It's a similar time as Esther. Um, and Nehemiah was a, um, let me give you like, even like the movie trailer of our, of our boy Nehemiah that we're going to be talking about even today. And uh, Nehemiah was an official in the king's court that was not in his homeland. So he's a Jew. He's in the king's court. Artaxerxes at the time, he's a Jew in the king's court. And uh, he was the cupbearer and he was doing his job, doing his thing. He was exiled. So he's not in his homeland, just like Esther was. And um, some people come from the homeland and he asked them a question. He says, hey, how's the homeland? How is Jerusalem? And they answer, hey, it's, it's in ruins. It's a mess. They've been trying to rebuild the temple. Um, the walls are torn down. And then it gets this picture where Nehemiah hears it. And he hears about the deconstruction that's happened in his homeland and the place it's in. And he, get, he just gets overwhelmed. He, he drops to his knees. He weeps. He's burdened. He fasts and prays. And then he starts the process of how's he going to do something about it. That's our boy, Nehemiah. And we're going to be talking about rebuilding, a time of rebuilding. Now, I have this leadership phrase that's uh, from our boy Craig Rochelle, who's a pastor over in Oklahoma, and I, I've loved it. I've chewed on it for a while now, and it says this, and it's going to be on your screen right there. Um, Every leadership challenge or explosive innovation is a result of a problem to solve, limited resources, a willingness to fail, and then a crazy idea. So explosive innovation, right? Like real change that some of us are longing for in 2021. Real change that we need is a result of a real problem to solve, a, a limited resources, a willingness to fail, and a crazy idea. And if you plus, 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 plus right there, man, you're going to get some explosive innovation. It's this moment of getting out of what would be the palace as a cupbearer in the king's court to maybe go do something about the walls that are torn down. And in 2021, I want to be challenging you. Maybe you've been comfortable in the space you're in. You're recognizing the problems in your life and in the world around you. And you feel maybe a little prompting of you're not going to sit in the king's court anymore. You're going to go do something about it. You see a problem to solve. There is limited resources, whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's relationships, whether it's authority. You have limited resources. If you'll get that faith, that willingness to fail with a crazy idea, we're going to see explosive innovation. There's a movie, and uh, how many of you guys have ever seen the movie Moneyball? Anybody? Thank you, Blake. <laughs> I asked Angelica to watch it two weeks ago. She ignored my prompt, but uh, it's a really... <laughs> Put her on blast right here, 2021. One of my favorite leadership movies. It's about a guy, it's a movie about a guy named Billy Bean. In the uh, late 1990s, um, his team, he was a general manager of a Major League Baseball team called Oakland Athletics. They had just lost, 
And when they lost at the end of their season, the New York Yankees, which are, let's just call them like Darth Vader, came in and took all of his best players. So now he has no money. The Oakland Athletics have no money. And all his best players are gone. Coolest story, leadership moment. His, the walls of his team are completely torn down. And he went to the owner and he says, hey, listen, uh, you've given me a budget of $40 million, which a lot of us like that budget, but for a Major League Baseball team, it's not a lot. The New York Yankees have a budget of $120 million. I need more money. And the owner looked at him and said, I ain't got any more money. Build me a championship team. And Billy Bean sat there and he's like, you just can't do that. They just took all of our three of our best players. They have 120. I can't compete with them. He said, well, this is your budget. Win me a championship. And at the beginning of the movie, I'm like, yes, because he had a problem to solve like Nehemiah, in just a second, limited resources, he had to go for it, and he came up with the craziest idea. He found a Yale graduate that was a mathematician and a statistics guy, and he built a new team based on a statistical analysis that the Major League Baseball had never used. He, he did, and he took a risk that changed the landscape of Major League Baseball. For the last 20 years, Billy Bean and how he built the Oakland Athletics in that year, and I'm not gonna spoil the movie for you right now. Um, <laughs> in, uh, um, in, that, in, that, in, in his lifetime, in that season changed because he had a problem to solve. Listen, I know you've got problems. Man, we got issues and we don't have, we got issues, we got problems. And we're talking about our boy Nehemiah because Nehemiah was a leader. I was talking with Angelica, one of the first books she ever read in the Bible was the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a leader. And maybe you don't feel like a leader of yourself because it starts there. Everyone's leading at least themselves in some capacity. Then they maybe have, you're a single mom, you've got leadership over kids or your dad or your wife or you've got a classroom, you're a teacher, you've got a nonprofit you're leading, you've got a small business. You've got employees, a team. Everyone's leading something. Everyone is a leader. I know maybe you don't look at yourself as a leader. Everyone is leading something. It's just according to what you're doing with that. And from this book of Nehemiah, I want you to discover some principles that could change 2021 for you. All right, so stand with me. Um, Eric, you're going to have to watch out because you're going to stand in front of the camera. But wherever you're at, stand with me. We're going to read a passage of Scripture in Nehemiah chapter 1. Verses 1 through 4. Nehemiah, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakala. <laughs> it's so hard to pronounce some of these words. I give them my best effort. Now, it happened in the month of Chislev, that's important, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brothers, came with a certain man from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, and this is what I was referring to in the movie clip version of the book of Nehemiah, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. In verse four, you see what maybe is the space you're in. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Lord, I I love you and I'm so thankful for everyone watching right now, all across the state, all across the nations. And I pray right now, Lord, that we'd be stirred by Nehemiah and his leadership and how he responded to the crisis in front of him. And you put a mantle on us of leadership like we've never had before in the season. In Jesus' name. If you agree, would you say amen? amen? Have a seat. So when we're looking at our boy Nehemiah, who had a problem to solve, walls are torn down in his homeland. There's shame on his homeland. He had limited resources, really no outlet to do anything about it. But he had a willingness to do something and a crazy idea. And the first thing we learn from Nehemiah is this. Embrace the burden. Maybe you want to write that down. Embrace the burden that God's putting on you. Embrace the burden. In Nehemiah 1.4, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. There was a lot of other exiled Jews that were hearing it and it wasn't marking them in the moment. 
Like even when I think about Missionary Sam, you, when we heard the story of Missionary Sam, who we gave crazy money in 2020, he was living in a culture where sex trafficking kids is a part of the culture. A lot of people saw it, but for Sam, it hit him. And for you and I, sometimes we're seeing issues and injustices around us. And rather than letting those burdens hit us, we deflect from them because we got stuff to do and it's going to cost us something. Could I challenge you to embrace the burden? Embrace what you are seeing in the world that is not right. (laughs) You know what heaven's supposed to look like and then we see earth and when it's not right, but we just want to move on. See, missionary Sam, who's a hero in the faith, embraced the burden. When I was a part of um, orphan outreach and we went to Honduras, I remember being um, in this uh, village that had been built for years. Up on the top of the mountain was a um, dump site. And I, I remember the story of Johnny taking his daughter to that dump site and his daughter saying, Dad, who's going to educate these kids that are living on the dump site? And like a lot of dads, they just take their kids and Shh, keep going, keep going, keep going. But Johnny said, no, 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 I'm going to embrace the burden of generations living on a dump site, and I'm going to do something about it. It's called AFE, right? Orphan Outreach is one of the ministries we support. When I think of Allison with Created, she saw women trafficked in our city. She didn't just pass by them down the street. She embraced the burden. Maru Opobolo, who cares about justice and how the world is hijacking justice. So she's like, I'm going to start a nonprofit called Jesus Loves Justice. The, the, the most just king in the world is Jesus. Mike Bickle with International House of Prayer. Some, Eric, you've been up there, right? It's amazing. 20 years of 24-7 prayer. God put a burden on his heart that there was a prayer foundation that revival in this nation and the world needed. So he started a 24-7 prayer center because he embraced the burden. Brooke is in this right now. Brooke has embraced the burden for the lostness of this generation, Generation Z that don't know Jesus. Um, Eric Dennis is right here. He's, I remember seven years ago, we said Christians don't know the Bible, they don't know Jesus, and they're not well trained to do ministry. So we said, Eric said, can I start a ministry that's going to train, and now it's blossomed in the school of ministry that has 70 students. Come on, <laughs> Pastor Mike, when you hear him talk about it, he saw that churches care about attendance, they care about buildings, they care about cash flow. They're ABC. And when you measure a church by the ABCs, and he said, it is not okay that the church measures its success by attendance and buildings and cash flow. What we want to measure is disciples. And you don't count them, you weigh them. Or do they have authority? Do they have maturity in them? I'm thankful that he embraced the burden to have a, a church that makes disciples that just doesn't care about um, quantity it cares more about quality would you I don't even know what you're facing and maybe it's something grand and large like rebuilding a wall around a city or maybe it's something simple like your personal leadership of your life and maybe Jesus Christ there's a burden that he hasn't been the Lord of your life maybe he's your savior and he's not your Lord and the walls of your spiritual life are broken down they've been deconstructed could I encourage you to embrace that And repent of that and say, God, would you stir me afresh in 2021 to be a a fully follower of you? Maybe you want to embrace the burden for your personal spiritual leadership, for your health, for your family's finances. Maybe you want to embrace that version, that, that burden. Embracing the burden, and this is what I love about it, produces a vision. Man, vision is that machine that gets you going. When you can see it... Vision's everything. And you get a burden and it bothers you. You don't look at Jerusalem with the walls down. Everyone else is seeing the walls down. But Nehemiah saw it with the walls up. (laughs) He saw it with the walls up. I know you've got issues and problems. When you get a burden, vision produces something. A vision becomes a moral imperative. I have to do something about that issue or that problem. It becomes a moral imperative, not just something that could be, but something, this is distinct, should be. It, there's, a sh- there's a shift in that like, oh yeah, it could be rebuilt to like, it's got to be rebuilt. And in this passage, Nehemiah heard about the hopelessness, the fear, the despair, and ultimately the destruction in his homeland, and it broke him. And he says, I'm going to rebuild it. I'm going to do something with it. You've got a burden on your heart coming into 2021. Maybe it's personal. Maybe it's corporate. Maybe it's family. 
what do you do with it? I mean, <laughs> I, I grew up and there's all these crazy cartoons and shows we'd watch. We, our stations were limited. I used to be a Atlanta Braves fan because we only had TBS growing up. <laughs> so <laughs> every night, the only thing showing was the Atlanta Braves. And, uh, but one show we watched is Popeye the Sailor Man. And you guys, maybe you guys have seen him. Maybe we'll put a picture up right now of Popeye the Sailor Man. And he would just go about his business and then people kept messing with his girl, Olive Oil. And he's like, I've taken all I can stands. I can't stands no more. <laughs> you guys remember? And what'd he do? He'd eat spinach. And that was my mom's excuse. If you want to be like Popeye, eat spinach. And I was like, I don't want to be like that guy. You know, <laughs> not that much. And then he would like, he would move and react and he would do whatever it takes to do something about the injustice in front of him. I'm hoping even right now, there's something in your heart and your mind where you're like, I've, I've taken all I can stand. I just, I can't stand no more. And you embrace the burden like Nehemiah did. So Nehemiah embraced the burden. And then this is what's beautiful about the story. The next piece of this is you have to maximize the gap. Say that with me. Say maximize the gap. Because the there's a space between when you get the burden, you see the vision till you're able to do something about it. And what do you do in the gap? What are you doing in the gap? I mean, if you look at this passage in, in verse 1, 1, 1, it says in the month of Kislev. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, it says in the month of Ninan. So in between he got the burden, chapter 1, verse 1, he saw his homeland, heard about it. It broke him. Chapter 2 in Ninan is when he's saying something to the king. In the Hebrew calendar, that's a four-month gap right there. So what did he do between Kislev and Ninon? Some of us, we don't want just the problem solved. We want it solved now. There's some systematic problems in your life, in thought life, that are not going to just be gone because you prayed them. It's going to require a, it's a deconstruction and a reconstruction. It's going to require some work between Kislev and Ninon. What do you got to do and maximize the gap? And this is what I love about Nehemiah. It shows what he did. In verse 4, we just read, For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed. In chapter 2, verse 4, when he's before the king, it says one more time, I prayed and I spoke. There is a, something you can embrace in the season right now. If you're feeling a burden of change for this new year, and it's to embrace extraordinary prayer. Extraordinary prayer and fasting. I mean, not just ordinary because I think we all have ordinary is what you're doing right now. When you get a burden, it's going to require something beyond ordinary. It's going to require extraordinary prayer. <laughs> it's going to require a shift of some kind. See, he was probably someone who prayed and fasted, but then there was a shift. See, we're about to start Greenhouse, and it's one of my highlight months of the year, but it's also, we know, one of the most painful. But we... we <laughs> In January, we fast and pray. It's what we do. And at the end of this month, in January 25th through the 3rd, we're going to do 10 days of fasting. And uh, woo -woo. <laughs> it's, like that, it's like that moment of, I'm so excited of the fruit, but I'm not excited about the plowing. Isn't that humanity? Because I've tasted now, this is probably like the six, seven year we've done a 10-day fast. I've tasted the fruit of sacrificing and denying myself for personal and people I love in this city, in this community, I've tasted the fruit. But I gotta be honest with you, I've, the fruit of that, but it's still, I see it in the distance coming and I'm like, let me eat more right now <laughs> in preparation. I wanna challenge you in January. I mean, seriously, I wanna challenge you to stretch yourself in prayer and fasting like you never have before. Your life, your city, your church, your family, this nation, this world needs the church to press in in ways it has never pressed in before. It doesn't need ordinary. It needs extraordinary. Nehemiah showed us Kislev gets the burden. Ninan is when you're going to be able to do something about it. Maximize the gap, pray and fast. January for Greenhouse is about prayer and fasting, giving yourself. So let's just say this is your routine when it comes to relating to God in prayer. This is your relationship with the discipline of fasting to engage with him and see bondages broken other people. This is your routine. This is ordinary for you. Determine what is baseline ordinary and do extraordinary. Do extra beyond that. 
even we've got a website up. I think it's Prayer 2021 that you can access right after this that's going to give you some resources to be able to help you an outline of um, facilities being open for those times, different prayer meetings, different resources. I think we may do a God-seeking intensive to be able to help you be able to grow in this area. Let in the gap between burden, you got to do something like a lot of us feel for 2021, and the ability to actually do something about it, extraordinary prayer. The other one is this, and this is what I love about Nehemiah. He actually had detailed planning during the gap detail planning he wasn't just praying and not working he was putting a plan together on how to rebuild that wall it's beautiful leadership is this leadership is not like ah, one day i'm going to do something about that mm, nehemiah started working because you read the story in chapter 2 verse 1 it says that um, he was sad in the presence of the king. Now, listen, officials didn't walk in and when they were sad, especially for the cupbearer, you kind of like, you got one job. <laughs> Do your one job right. Here's your wine. Oh, thank you. Good job. You got, one, <laughs> you got one job. You can be happy for that moment in time. And he was sad in the presence of the king. This is like the Esther moment, right? Like, are you the Esther moment? This is his moment. And they asked him, why are, you, why are you sad in my presence? And this is what I love. It says, then I prayed to the God of heaven. <laughs> Isn't it funny? Because um, I'm wondering, because some of us are like, you know, did he go like, hold on one second, king. And he just turned and had this like dialogue with God. <laughs> no, I think what happened is he's like, why are you sad in my presence? And, and, and he just took this moment and went like, and he had been in a habit for four months now of talking to God about this. And he says, this is my moment. And then he said, how can I be happy when, when my, the walls of my city are broken down and people are in shame and they're, they're, they're afraid and they're unprotected? How can I be happy right now? So he had prayed and fasted. God had set the stage to soften the king's heart. And the king's heart said, hey, and, and he asked the question, what do you want to do? He's like, send me. He's like, you can go. And then it's like this. Nehemiah went, thank you, king. And then he maybe took a step like this. And then because he had been planning, he knew he couldn't just go. He knew what he needed. So he turned back to the king and he said, you know what, king, I'm ready to go, but I need a few things. I need letters to this governor that's going to give me safe passage to Jerusalem. I need letters to th this king because I need the timber that's in his land. I need some resources from you to be able to execute this burden and rebuild these walls. He was ready so some of us are complaining. Listen, there's, he was planning. He wasn't just like spirit and floating in the heavens, third heaven, being like, I'm just praying God's going to take it. No, no. He was praying and he was planning for the transformation that needed to happen. Maybe you feel some type of burden. I would encourage you to pray and fast in extraordinary ways and plan with detail like you never had before. I love the, the book um, Circle Maker by Mark Batterson. You guys ever read that book? Really good book. But when you read it, one of the most encouraging things about it is he had a burden for Washington, D.C. And then he just started walking it days and months, making a loop and asking God to move for months and months and months and months. And then he started thinking and planning and processing. Because here's the, and we know this, when the, when the burden's real and the vision's hot, you can't help but plan and think. You're just going to be like... You're going to be thinking and chewing and processing. Could I encourage you? Embrace the burden. Maximize the gap. And here's another point. Expect some op opposition. <laughs> Expect opposition. You're like, I can't wait. Everyone's going to buy in and be so excited about how, what God's laid on my heart. No, no, it's going to be hard. <laughs> It's going to be painful. Even if like, you've got a vision for your own personal life right now and you're repenting and turning to the Lordship of Jesus, you're like, whew, I'm glad that's done. Now let me move forward in the way I am. No, no, get ready. <laughs> you're like, isn't, the, isn't it just going to, things are going to part and they're going to move? No, there's going to be opposition. Even with Nehemiah in verse chapter 2, verse 10, and he kind of went through that God had sent him, I mean, the king had sent him, giving him all these letters in favor and said, go. Verse 10 says, but when Sambalot, the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite serve, servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. Immediately. Now they didn't come back into the story for a few chapters, but they just want to let you know, hey, you got the king's favor and you've got access and you can go, but hey, hey, there's a villain in the story. 
I guess who was the villain in Esther? It was Haman, right? Yeah. Boo, right? <laughs> Sambalot. <Boo>. Thank you. <laughs> you can expect opposition. There's a burden. There's, a, there's an embracing of that. There's maximizing the gap. And as you move forward, I'd like to tell you it's going to be easy. But we all know establishing heaven on earth is not easy. Even with Jesus, Hebrews chapter 12, I was reading it in preparation for this. Consider him who did what? Endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not do what? Grow weary and lose heart. When you're moving toward God's calling in your life in 2021, there's a temptation to grow weary and lose heart. What, who am I going to look to so I don't grow weary and lose heart? I need greenhouse. I need this. I need this. No, listen, consider Jesus. <laughs> He's the hero. He's the man. So like, and he, as he was trying to move forward, was a, a, a opposed by sinful men. There is going to be Sambalots in your life, in your personal life, and in your future, whatever burden God's put in front of you. You know, uh, missionary Sam, who I keep referencing because he's one of my heroes, um, uses the word when church planting. He says, we plant, and they've planted thousands of churches, like thousands of greenhouse churches all over Asia. And... Um, he calls people that can go do that groundbreakers. Groundbreakers. And you see this picture of this dry and hard land that there's going to hopefully produce kingdom of heaven fruit. You can't just dance in there. You need something with a, somebody, certain types of people, with a certain fortitude to them. Some of my heroes in Greenhouse are Scott and Selena Brown. Do you guys know Scott and Selena Brown? So when we launched the university service about seven years ago, they showed up and they're like, let's go. And I said, you guys live down in Ocala. And they're like, we're going to drive up every Sunday night. And I said, I said, well, you're kind of not in the age gap because they're in their, you know, <laughs> above 50. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and I said, this is college students. And they're like, Robbie, this is what we do. We're groundbreakers. And they started a ministry. They flourished. They came early. They stayed late. They mentored students. Then we're like, hey, let's do something great in Greenhouse Orlando. And he's like, well, the university is established. We're coming down to Orlando. And I'm like, all right. And so I remember going down when, you know, at that time Orlando was in a, um, a school and they're doing set up and tear down. The sweatiness people, the hardest working people in the room were Scott and Selena Brown. Their grandchild is running around. They're trying to take care of all of this stuff. <laughs> They're sweating before service and after service, coming the earliest and staying the latest. And I remember saying, like, you guys are, and he's like, this is what we do. We're groundbreakers. And Troy and Heather, <laughs> he's like, this family's special, and we're here with you. We're for you. We're going to be fighting for you, praying for you. There's a certain fortitude in groundbreakers. And if you're in a season of going to be rebuilding, I, want to, I just want to acknowledge, I think a lot of people get vision, but they get stunted in their growth. It's like gyms right now in January. They know enrollment is way up. <laughs> this is Resolution City. Some of us see a vision for our personal health, and we're like, we see the walls down. We see um, there's invaders everywhere. We've got to do something. We enroll in a gym, and we're going to change. And that usually lasts through January, because then Sambalot hits. Hits. Opposition hits, and we know that experience and that feeling. Listen, as you're moving forward, don't be discouraged when you're facing opposition. When you're feeling discouraged and lies and people, whatever it may be, just know that you're in a season of groundbreaking. All right, so I could, and this is what's exciting. I'm kind of giving like the highlight reel of a few points. Later this year in Greenhouse, I think we're going to do a whole series on our boy Nehemiah. And so you, I, I can't wait because he is, as a leader, He's someone that models and is ultimately, I'd say, a type of Jesus. It's a foreshadowing of someone to come. Because Nehemiah is in the palace, say, secure, and sense a need to go and do something about the destruction of his homeland. See, the message of the gospel is Jesus Christ, right? He's in the palace. He's with God. And God sends his only son to suffer, to rebuild our lives, to restore humanity. The message of the gospel is 
that, that Jesus gave up everything to be able to restore us. So when you're looking at Nehemiah, the hero of every Bible verse, the hero of this whole story narrative and everything highlighting is there's a God. Listen, we all know this. You can put physical walls around you, but the real problem of humanity is not the fear of things outside of you. It's the problem on the inside of you. So Nehemiah is building a physical wall to try and protect people. That didn't fix Jerusalem. That didn't fix the people of God. And it was prophesying the problem for the people of God is not the shame and fear that's caused because of things on the outside. The real problem is it's the it's not the walls on the outside. It's the heart on the inside. That's why Ezekiel prophesied they've got hearts of stone. They need hearts of flesh. We needed a God who could not just fix our outsides, but could change our very hearts. See, I, I, I hope external situations change, but you and I know the biggest issue is deep inside of us. And right at the beginning of this year, maybe you've never had a relationship with God. The beautiful message of the gospel is that we can have a rightness with God, a right relationship with God, a real understanding, and we can know him and he can know us and we can be saved for all eternity through the blood, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Man, that's it. Come on. <laughs> And even maybe today, you want to you wanna just bow your knees and say, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. See, you need power, and you want power to change the world around you. The power is not from some external motivator and some imp- inspirational speech, and that will last for a while, and it will help you not to grow weary. The real engine and authority you need is a spirit on the inside enabling you to do the work on the outside. So would you just submit to his leadership, his authority? For those of you who are followers of Jesus, you're already born from above. I want this to be a year of unprecedented harvest, unprecedented prayer, more unity in the body of Christ than we've ever experienced. It is going to require us to jump in to this extraordinary time of prayer and fasting. The walls of the church of Jesus Christ and of greenhouse need to be rebuilt. And we're asking you and we're calling you and inviting you in. So even right now, those of you who are with me here, even online, let's take a moment right at the beginning of 2021 and let's just drop to our knees. Can you do that for just a time of prayer? And we're going to pray into this a little bit. We're going to pray into this vision for a burden from the Lord that we'd maximize the gap with extraordinary prayer and we'd see our lives, our cities rebuilt. Let me pray for us and maybe you want to surrender right there where you're at. God, I love you. Thank you for everyone that's engaging right now that's on their knees. And we submit to your lordship. God, we ask for your heart, your passion, your fortitude for our families, for our cities, for our churches, God, please. And in this season, God, would you give us a renewed strength to press in. And would God, would you help us to see real change? So right now we submit ourselves for this season, for a year of rebuilding. God, we repent for fear and doubt and slothfulness and gluttony and um, uh, rebellion and disobedience in 2020. And Lord, we start fresh today. We thank you that you're going to lead us. You're going to strengthen us. We love you. We praise you, God. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that, would you say amen? Amen. Come on, man. Let's go. Hey, thank you for joining online. We'll see you guys live, hopefully in person in the coming weeks. If you need prayer, please text into that number right there. We love you guys. Let's, Let's press in. Extraordinary Prayer 2021.